can happen really bad out there. You know, we're going out there trying to do this, and and we love this, and we and and it's so rewarding for us too, and uh, and and we love doing it for all of you. Um, but this this is what's going to happen. Some of us have spent the better part of the last 30 years together every day, and uh, when we have to um, get the news that one of our brothers. Um, passes away. It's really hard. This is 33-year-old Owen Hart, known as the Blue Blazer. He fell 50 feet while being lowered from a ceiling at Kemper Arena tonight. Mike theoretically died in my arms. Uh, when I first got to him, he had the last, you know, who can really say, but he had a faint pulse. And when that went away, everybody knew. It shows you how fragile life is, even to big, strong, tough individuals who, like in our profession, sometimes we think we're invincible, but you, you know, something like this happens, it makes you realize that uh, uh, how precious life is because it can be gone in a wink of an eye. In my opinion, pro wrestling is an art form, and the performers in the ring are artists. In the same way that master painter picks up a passion for laying out imagery on a canvas, with a brush, pro wrestlers learn to master their chosen creative output whilst laying out matches on a canvas of their own. Some artists are born with a natural gift, a skill for expressing themselves through their chosen endeavour to bring joy and insight to the world around them through their work. Most artists, however, spend their lives learning the skills required to convey their artistic vision, and pro wrestlers are no different. To be a top performer in the squared circle, it takes passion, dedication and time. Often wrestlers will spend their entire working lives performing for the entertainment of us, the fans, in order to supply us with memorable moments which will go down in the history of the pro wrestling business. It's hard work, a cutthroat industry and most times extremely dangerous. In this video, I want to look at and honour the legacy of those who have not only spent a huge chunk of their life on this earth attempting to entertain us, but those who have given their lives to the ring. I want to relive some of pro wrestling's darkest days through the harrowing stories of those who have died. A sad topic for sure, but one which I think is important to recognise. I want to see just how these horrific incidents occurred and if they could have been prevented. I want to see if there is a correlation between the causes of these tragedies and, most importantly, pay respect to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. As women more commonly begun to make their transition from simply accompanying their male counterparts to the ring in the wrestling world in the 1950s, a young protégé of the great Tony Stretcher began her training with what industry insiders at the time were looking at as the potential next big thing in the world of women's wrestling. Jeanette Wolfe, born Jeanette Boyer, was 5 foot 3 and weighed a little over 120 pounds. Her size was clearly not the reason for which she stood out amongst her classmates of larger, more powerful wrestling trainees. However, Ms Wolfe is said to have possessed a combination of dedication to her craft and a charisma which even to this day you seemingly cannot teach. At the age of 17, Jeanette showed such great potential that legendary promoters and wrestling icons Mildred Burke and her husband Billy Wolf sought to adopt the young upstart and took her under their wing, legally changing her name from her birth of Boyer to what we now recognise today as Jeanette Wolf. By 1951, the pair believed Jeanette to be ready to make the transition from training in the gym to performing in front of a crowd. Thus, by June, Ms. Wolf had stepped between the ropes to make her long-awaited debut. By July, Jeanette had battled in two matches, but her third and fourth would prove to be her undoing. On July 28, 1951, she fought in a match against Ella Waldeck and was routinely beaten by the more experienced wrestler. As Jeanette made her way backstage, she complained to the show's promoter that she was suffering from a severe headache, though not much attention was given to the young wrestler's ailments. 
After all, Jeanette Wolfe was scheduled for a second fight later on in the card, and nothing could stand in the way of the promoter's promised fixtures. An hour or so later, with her headache only worsening, Jeanette made her way to the ring with her partner Eva Lee to face off against Ella Waldeck and Mae Young. Following a ferocious body slam administered by Waldeck, Wolfe suffered a concussion and tagged out unexpectedly. Making her way onto the ring apron where attendees of the show say she looked confused and off balance. As the match ended, Wolf knew that something was wrong. She collapsed from the side of the ring apron and was carried to the back. A freak accident had caused a ruptured vein in her stomach to bleed profusely. She had also suffered a blood clot on her brain which ended her promising young life only four hours later. After the tragedy, Ohio police arrested Eva Lee, Ella Waldeck and Mae Young with a charge of manslaughter. A trial took place a while later where the judge ruled the incident to be accidental and all three were released. Mike theoretically died in my arms. Uh, when I first got to him, he had the latter, you know, who can really say, but he had a faint pulse. And when that went away, everybody knew. You know, no one tells you when your time's up. For the people of uh, Lubbock, Texas, uh, it, that place went from a madhouse to, I mean, virtually a morgue. You've all probably heard of the 80s and 90s money-splashing legend, Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. But did you know that before he played the role of a man who could have it all due to his enormous wealth and lavish lifestyle, his early life was struck with the most terrible of tragedies. Like many who entered between the ropes of pro wrestling ring, Ted DiBiase had a family lineage within the grappling business. His adopted father, Iron Mike DiBiase, was a vastly experienced performer, known for his in-ring technique and grappling prowess which saw his career laden with many a title belt. However, what Mike DiBiase is unfortunately best remembered for was the unfortunate and saddening way in which his excellent career was brought to a sudden halt. During a match on July 2nd, 1969, Iron Mike faced off against one of the biggest wrestlers of his generation, the 600-pound man Mountain Mike in a contest in Texas. All was seemingly going as planned with the pair putting on a show which was expertly entertaining the crowd when the unimaginable happened. Mike DiBiase suffered an enormous heart attack moments into the bout and collapsed in a terrifying heap on the canvas. Industry legend Harley Race rushed in to the aid of DiBiase and began to administer CPR, relentlessly pushing up and down on DiBiase's chest, awaiting the arrival of an ambulance. Race's efforts were in vain, however, as the heart attack which had pulled the match to a shuddering halt was ferocious, taking the life of Mike DiBiase, who was sadly only 45 at the time, to the shock of the onlooking crowd. When Luther Lindsay began his journey in the pro wrestling business in the 1940s, an arena full of white working class grappling fans was not a friendly place for a large black man, especially as segregation was still in full effect. Lindsay, however, never let the negativity interrupt his rise to stardom as he used his expert knowledge of wrestling techniques along with his naturally impressive physique to wow even the most die-hard racists in the crowd. Trained by legendary hardman Stu Hart, it is said that the stoic Canadian always kept a picture of Luther Lindsay in his wallet as an honour to the only man to have ever legitimately submitted him within a wrestling ring. This toughness, alongside his ability to entertain the crowd, saw Lindsay earn the respect of other industry icons such as Lou Thez on his way to having the first interracial wrestling match to occur in the south of the states in the 1950s. By 1972, Luther Lindsay had overcome every bigoted hurdle put in his way and cemented his legacy amongst the wrestling industry's pioneers, a point that made one night on February the 21st, 1972, all the more regrettable. During a match with a wrestler by the name of Bobby Paul, 
Lindsay delivered his classic diving belly flop, and as he had done so many times throughout his career, held his opponent down for the three count and the victory. However, it was immediately discovered that Lindsay had suffered a powerful and life-ending heart attack during his manoeuvre and died whilst the referee was still counting the pin. Terrible for all involved and a real moment of horror for the participants in the ring. Attempts to resuscitate Lindsay failed and he was pronounced dead where he lay, ending his career with a victory, one which a man such as Luther Lindsay and his many struggles within the industry deserved. Since then, he has been named in multiple Hall of Fames and given more credit for his hard work and dedication to making pro wrestling and the wider world of sports and entertainment a more accepting place for everyone. After a tag match at the Hippodrome Circus Great Yarmouth, during which Big Daddy threw his full weight of 24 stones on top of him. It's a manoeuvre which is known as the Splashdown and which Big Daddy says should now be banned. A legend of the local British wrestling scene, Mal King Kong Kirk took pride in his ability to use his 350 pound frame and grotesque appearance to scare the little children who dared to attend his matches. A former professional rugby player and all-round powerhouse, it was said by Shirley Big Daddy Crabtree that Mole Kirk possessed the strength of three men when he battled in ring throughout the 70s and 80s. On August the 23rd, 1987, at the Hippodrome in Great Yarmouth, Kirk faced off against Big Daddy in a classic battle of good versus evil, portrayed by two of the fattest and most revered wrestlers on the British scene at the time. 24 Stone Big Daddy is wrestling's biggest crowd puller. It's a form of entertainment where despite extravagant shows of force, serious injuries have been few. There's always been a suspicion that the contests have been more about theatre than full-blooded sport. It is, however, an undeniably tough way to make a living, and at the Hippodrome in Great Yarmouth last night, Big Daddy performed one of his favourite moves, a splashdown, where he dives straight on top of his opponent. As was usually the case in these matches, Kurt had the advantage throughout the match, delivering his slow but powerful offence to the crowd favourite. In order to send fans home happy, however, it was decided that Big Daddy would get the eventual comeback within the match, and so it played out on that fateful day. As Big Daddy hauled his enormous body into the air and came crashing down with his patented Big Splash finisher, it signalled the end of the match. Little did those in attendance realise it also signalled the end of King Kong Kirk's life. Malcolm Kirk, known as King Kong Kirk, died after the move. Medical teams at the ringside had tried to save him, but couldn't. This afternoon, Big Daddy said he would continue wrestling, but was stunned by the tragedy. I mean, in the match, I had uh, wrestled him. I mean, he was as strong as three men. He was 25 stone. He was known as the Pitman's Hercules. And as long as I live, I'll never forget seeing him laid down there on the canvas, uh, instead of on his feet raging and, and, you know, and flying about. And that will stay with me. The big man never lifted his arm to kick out of the big splash, neither did he move once the final bell had been rung. Laying prone in the ring, with fans making their way to the exit, imagining that the show had drawn to its natural conclusion. However, a formal inquest showed that Kirk had suffered complications due to a pre-existing heart condition and died in the middle of the ring. Big Daddy was released of all wrongdoing by the same inquest and King Kong's surviving wife consoled him, explaining that she held no ill feelings towards Big Daddy and that nobody should hold him in any way responsible for the tragedy which occurred. Another name from this list who you probably haven't heard of is Matt Riot Lowry. Like Brian Ong, Lowry was a young up-and-comer who hadn't had a chance to make a name for himself in the wrestling business before his untimely demise. During what could be considered a completely routine training session, Matt Lowry was doing what almost all new wrestling trainees would do on his first steps to wrestling infamy, learning how to fall to the mat correctly. Taking a back bump as it's known in the industry, although painful, with a good chance to knock the wind out of you, is something that these performers achieve thousands of times throughout their training, usually 
with little more consequence than a bruised back and some soreness. However, during said training session on September the 15th, 2009, Matt Lowry became extremely dizzy and confused, falling to his knees before eventually passing out. Some speculated that it was due to dehydration or general exhaustion. Seeing that something was clearly wrong, the wrestlers and trainers called an ambulance and Lowry was taken to a local hospital in Ohio where he sadly never recovered. The 21-year-old died due to what was discovered to be a deadly brain hemorrhage and his wrestling career and life ended before it even got a chance to get going. Immediate surgery to her head, where the doctors found a prayer of being allowed to fight in her condition, imploring. Just know one thing when everybody walks outside tonight and you look up into the sky, the brightest star will be Pedro Perrito Aguayo. We all remember those adverts which would play alongside our favourite wrestling shows when we were growing up. Don't try this at home. It's not just a simple slogan, but one intended to prevent any real life tragedy occurring if a person was to replicate the actions they had witnessed from their favourite wrestlers. The moves we see these experts perform in the ring are designed to amaze and entertain us whilst inflicting as little damage as possible to their opponent. However, in 2015, a freak accident occurred when a move was performed one that had been used hundreds if not thousands of times safely before and would end the life of a popular luchador known as Perro Aguayo. The son of a Mexican wrestling legend has died after suffering a blow in the ring. I'm Jim Basquiat with the latest ESPN headlines. His name is Pedro Aguayo Ramirez. He fell unconscious on the ropes after being kicked by fellow wrestler Oscar Gutierrez, who's known as former WWE star Rey Mysterio Jr. The match actually continued on for some two minutes before those on hand realized that Aguayo had suffered a serious injury. In a match on March 21st, the Mexican grappling star was taking part in a tag team bout alongside his partner Manic against Extreme Tiger and WWE legend Rey Mysterio. With Perro Aguayo and Mysterio in the ring, Mysterio landed a picture-perfect dropkick on his opponent which sent him hurtling towards the ropes, a move which we've seen countless times from Mysterio which for decades, he is used to place his opponent in the perfect position, slumped over the second rope, facing out of the ring to pull off his famous 619 finisher. However, in this horrific incident, as Perro Aguayo fell towards the ropes, he landed awkwardly and fell unconscious. With the high-paced Lucha Libre match in full flow, Rey Mysterio, the other wrestlers, and even the fans failed to realise that Aguayo was not simply acting as if he had been injured as he slumped on one knee, he had in fact broken his neck. And, and it affects each and every one of us. Then uh, last night, we, we lost a brother. The match continued for over two minutes before the proceedings were called to a stop. Before any medical aid could be successful, Perro Aguayo sadly died in the ring of a heart attack caused by a cervical stroke, which occurred when his neck snapped off the middle rope. A truly horrific incident and one which left Mysterio so stricken with guilt he considered never stepping foot inside of a pro wrestling ring ever again. Aguayo's family knew that what had happened was simply a tragic accident and that Mysterio was in no way to blame, even going so far as to ask the masked luchador to help carry the coffin of his deceased opponent at his funeral. Hit show Lucha Underground hosted a sombre and respectful tribute to their fallen comrade, with notable figures from the Mexican wrestling scene speaking about how much Perro meant to them, as well as the wider wrestling world. It's clear to see the deep and profound impact that this man's death had on those who were lucky enough to know him in the ring and out. In the West, pro wrestling fans have Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock and Hulk Hogan. In the East, there is Mitsuharu Misawa, a Japanese wrestling icon who made his name as Tiger Mask. 
a name so recognisable that it eventually spread from humble beginnings in the 1980s to become a well-recognised name around the wrestling world. The founder of Pro Wrestling Noah saw his abilities take him to the very top of the wrestling mountain, being named the best grappler on the planet on three separate occasions. By 2009, Masawa was a legend of the business and when he did compete, drew hordes of fans to his events to get a glimpse of this slice of wrestling royalty. In a match where Masawa teamed with Go Shiozaki against the partners of Saito and Bison Smith on June the 13th, 2009, tragedy struck and fans in the Hiroshima-based arena were left in shock and horror. In Japan, wrestlers are lauded for their durability and intense brutality throughout their matches, often landing slams and throws on their heads and necks in order to deliver a visceral reaction from the crowd. The wrestlers spend years in wrestling dojos toughening their bodies through repeatedly taking suplexes and pile drivers, allowing for their bodies to absorb impact and protect them when the time comes to step in front of the fans. A back suplex then? should be no problem for Masawa and his battle-worn physique. However, during the match when Saito delivered what appeared to be a run-of-the-mill back suplex to Masawa, the wrestling icon did not return to his feet. Something had gone horrifically awry and the wrestlers in the ring realised this immediately as the match was called to an instant stoppage. The company's medical team rushed to the fall of Masawa as wrestlers surrounded his body to close off the view from the crowd. As they attempted to resuscitate Masawa, the fans in the arena chanted his name in a moment which will forever feel ominous and haunting. It was clear that Masawa had suffered from heart failure and seemingly the medical team's efforts were in vain, with their best attempts at CPR failing to revive the downed wrestler. He looked exhausted and I even asked him three times if he felt good. He said yes. He was always a very strong and fierce fighter. Actually, even if he felt bad, I don't think he would have told me. I noticed he suffocated, but I assumed it could be because of the same heat of that day and that more than 20 minutes of fighting had already passed. Ricky Marvin, who also fought at the event, said, It was a very dramatic moment. The truth is the first time I find myself in such a situation. I did not remember very well since everything happened very fast and at the same time very slow. I just remember asking God to keep him alive and not take him yet since it was not in my hands to give him first aid. I couldn't do anything. Masawa's body and face began to turn an alarming purple colour and he was carried off for further attention at a local hospital where he was pronounced dead. Though, judging by the sad way his limp body was removed from the ring, it's fair to assume he had passed away from his heart failure while still laying on the mat. Hiroshima University Hospital issued this statement later in the evening. The Emerald Warrior has died from a respiratory arrest generated by so many years of hard battles. Every name on this list tells a sad story of tragedy and loss. However, when someone the likes of Dan the Spider Quirk passes away, it leaves a hole in the hearts of those who knew him that will never truly be filled. Dan Quirk, by all accounts, was a great guy to know, a young wrestler with a bright future, who, who seemingly, nobody in the industry had a single negative word to say about. Up until his passing, Quirk worked for several smaller indie promotions, most notably Coastal Championship Wrestling, where he was always ready to lend a hand in any way needed backstage and was even responsible for running the company's website. During a match for Universal Championship Wrestling in Massachusetts on May the 28th, 2005, Dan Quirk attempted a moonsault which went about as wrong as it is possible for a move to go. He spun out of control and landed outside of the ring on the hard floor head first. The 22-year-old suffered several serious injuries and died almost immediately. The sad event caused huge distress around the wrestling world and those who knew him best put on a show in his honour in the months that followed. 
At WrestleJam 2, the CCW company brought all of its wrestlers to ringside to honour the short yet impactful life of Dan Quirk, showing a highlight reel of his matches and doing their best to put on an event which did justice to such a well-respected and much beloved young man. In pro wrestling, there are many moves which are designed to make it appear as if the performers have legitimately caused serious injury to one another. This can lead to more fan support for the supposed injured wrestler as they fight through the pain on their way to capture victory. However, after only three years as a professional wrestler, Jesus Javier Hernandez Silva was still learning the ropes when he began to attempt these kind of stunts in his matches. Known by his in-ring name of Oro, Silva was the son of a luchador who seemingly had wrestling in his DNA. In 1993, Oro performed a move in which he was supposed to appear to the crowd as if he had injured his neck, but cruel irony struck as during the performance, he landed awkwardly and in fact severely injured himself, collapsing in the ring. It was clear something was wrong as wrestlers and medical staff attempted to help Oro towards an ambulance, the young wrestler dying of what is believed to be an aneurysm before he could receive any medical aid. Uh, he was a, uh, a friend and, and uh, again a, a dear friend, uh, an asset to this industry and, uh, and a wonderful husband and um, he'll be sorely missed and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. After being trained by Lou Thez and Billy Robinson, Gary Albright and his enormous stature looked set to alight the wrestling landscape. Through his travels in the United States and across Japan, Albright quickly gained a reputation which had fans and wrestling critics alike lauding his potential. Anytime, any place you want it, I'll take you on any where. However, all of that was soon to come to a crashing stop. During a match on the 7th of January 2000, he fell down in the ring after receiving an ace cutter from his opponent Lucifer Grimm. The crowd in Pennsylvania were shocked to see the big man stay down and he was quickly pinned by his opponent. The story goes that Gary Albright was booked to win the match, but realising something had gone wrong, Lucifer pinned him to end the match so that he could immediately receive medical attention, which he did. Although, this sadly had little to no effect. Albright died in the ring before he could be examined by a doctor. The cause? A massive heart attack, said to be from an enlarged heart and coronary blockages due to his enormous weight. The man with all the potential in the world died at the young age of 36. A local wrestling legend dies in the ring. Tonight's top story is the sudden death of the man known as Moondog Spot. Here he is at the Mid-South Coliseum last night. Minutes later, the popular pro wrestler collapsed in front of thousands of fans. But the match went on because everyone thought it was part of the show. On a show laid out to pay tribute to Jerry the King Lawler on his birthday, during a match known as a concession stand brawl on November the 29th, 2003, tragedy struck. I literally talked to him uh, two minutes before he went into the ring for his match, and he seemed seemed fine. I mean, nobody had any idea. He just said, hey, something bad's happened to Larry. He's either had a heart attack or a stroke, and he's down in the ring. Larry was uh, just uh, about four or five minutes into the match. He just he just sort of slumped down over near the ropes, and, and I guess it was a couple of minutes before even the other wrestlers realized that there was something seriously wrong with him. The Memphis fans at the Mid-South Coliseum went from jubilant to confused to horrified, as former WWF Tag Team Champion Moondog Spot slumped down against the ropes and appeared to be injured. He sat there clutching his chest before falling onto his back. This was clearly not a scripted part of the match, and the medics in attendance quickly realised something was seriously wrong, making their way into the ring to provide CPR to the man whose real name was Larry Booker. With evidence that he was suffering from a heart attack, CPR was administered before an ambulance took him to a local hospital where, only moments later, Larry Booker was pronounced dead from a massive heart attack. 
Doctors said that the incident may have been brought on by the wrestler's diabetes, which caused his heart to fail under the stress of his last ever wrestling performance. It shows you how fragile life is, even to big, strong, tough individuals who, like in our profession, sometimes we think we're invincible. But you, you know, something like this happens, it makes you realize that uh, uh, how precious life is because it can be gone in a wink of an eye. Hart died in the fall. He survived by a wife, two children, his brother Brett. Hart was 33. Lou Blazer falls 50 feet to his death in a stunt gone wrong. An accident as millions of people watched on television. The first time I ever considered that wrestling was scripted came on a Monday evening in 1999. At school that day, I heard from a classmate of a tragedy that had occurred the night prior. I didn't believe of the horrific incident at first, especially being so young. It was one of the first times I'd encountered death in such a direct manner. Due to my lack of willingness to believe such a thing could happen in wrestling, my friend implored me to explore the internet for wrestling forums. As soon as I got home, I quickly discovered a dark hole of information I had previously never thought imaginable. I found pages and pages of tributes discussing the death of Owen Hart at the WWF Over the Edge pay-per-view on the 23rd of May 1999. My tiny mind exploded as I read for hours about Owen Hart's life, his family and his illustrious wrestling career. I stumbled deeper and saw online commenters discussing Owen Hart's character, his promo technique and his ability to make his opponents look great in the ring. I saw a transcript which explained Jim Ross's explanation on live television only minutes after Owen's fall. Jim explained that this is not a storyline, this is not part of the show. Me, at eight years old, the veil of ignorance moved just a minuscule amount as I wondered what good old J.R. Jim Ross meant. Storyline? What storyline? I was so confused. However, I was instantly distracted by the promise of what seemed like infinite wrestling information on these forums. I fell deeper in love with the history of Owen Hart and felt a real sense of sadness and remorse from the online community for the tragedy that had happened not 24 hours before. And indeed tragedy in the ring tonight in the world of pro wrestling. A form of entertainment which is known for its fantastic fiction is now experiencing horrific non-fiction. WWF wrestler Owen Hart, known professionally as the Blue Blazer, died tonight in Kansas City when he fell 50 feet into the ring as he was being lowered from the ceiling at Kemper Arena. The fall occurred in an event called Over the Edge, which was being televised to a pay-per-view audience. The 33-year-old Hart, given immediate CPR by paramedics, as a stunned crowd watched in horror, realizing that something had terribly gone wrong. In Kansas City, Missouri, the WWF were running through their usual smooth operations of what, at the time, seemed like another evening of hard-hitting action and over-the-top personalities. Little more than what fans had come to expect at the time. By the time the event was over, the fans in attendance and at home, the WWF staff and all of the wrestlers were involved in a moment that none will soon forget. One which will live in infamy for all of pro wrestling's existence. Our top story at 11, a former World Wrestling Federation champ is dead tonight. Once king of the ring, Owen Hart fell from the ceiling during an event in Kansas City. The audience at first thought it was a stunt. Millions of fans were tuned in on pay-per-view TV. As the night rolled on, time came for the intercontinental title match between the Godfather and Owen Hart's character, the Blue Blazer. To make an impactful entrance, Owen was set to glide to the ring on a harness connected to a long grapple line, his cape flying in the wind as this comedic superhero drew the attention of all in attendance. The lights of uncountable camera flashes reflect off of the glittering blue blazer's outfit and alight the arena with fans capturing a moment in history. As Owen Hart was lowering towards the ring, his harness catch released and he became unhooked from the supporting cable. As fans watched on in horror, the unthinkable happened, Owen plummeting towards the top rope from almost 80 feet above the ring and springing back onto the canvas. The atmosphere that fell over the arena as WWF cut the lights must have been sickening. Fans at home watching live 
were still unaware of the incident, WWF playing a pre-taped vignette as the feed had enough of a time delay for the production team to hide the horrors which were unfolding in front of them. WWF then cut only to shots of the crowd to allow time for the situation to be dealt with, controversially so as to be able to let the show continue. Controversial in hindsight perhaps, but at the time WWF had no idea what was happening and how things would play out over the next 30 minutes. Right before we were going to walk out, I just heard them screaming, saying it's not a fake, get a real EMT back here, he's not breathing, the ripcord fell, broke or something, I don't, I don't know, and they rushed him back, he was blue in the face, and they just rushed him out. Fans in the arena, however, were left initially in the dark, as WWF turned off the lights and played the television vignette on the large screens to try and draw attention away from Owen Hart. It was like a rope broke or something. Did it look like he got hurt really bad when he hit? Oh yeah, you could tell. My aunt, she wrestles and she said that he, she thought he was dead when he hit. Who was now laying prone in the ring, flat on his back with swarms of medical staff and other WWF employees rushing to his aid. As Jim Ross continued to reiterate the magnitude of the incidents of fans at home, the real tragedy unfolded at the nearby Truman Medical Center where, after several valiant attempts to resuscitate and revive Owen Hart, he sadly died due to internal bleeding caused by blunt force trauma. Truly, one of the most hard-hitting and emotional moments of all of pro wrestling history for so many fans and those employed in the business alike. The next night, Raw is Owen aired, a tribute episode of Monday Night Raw from the Kill Center in St. Louis. The broadcast began with all of the WWF staff, medical team, wrestlers and bookers out on the entrance ramp with Howard Finkel calling for a 10-bell salute. The traditional way in which wrestling has paid respect to fallen performers throughout its history. As the last bell, his time as part of the tag team champions and his victory of the King of the Ring title. One of the more heart-wrenching moments occurred when Mark Henry read aloud his poem in dedication to Owen, visibly distraught as he held back floods of tears, Mark Henry conveying emotions so deeply felt by those around him. All of the WWF staff were given the choice of continuing working that show, with Vince McMahon recognising the emotional toll Owen Hart's death had taken on his employees. We in the World Wrestling Federation are saddened by the tragic accident that occurred here tonight. And um, we send our condolences and sympathy to Owen Hart's family. Monday Night Raw continued in part as usual with 10 matches on the night but a less rehearsed, less scripted feel to the fight, as all storylines were halted for the evening. The program features interviews that were not shot in the usual high-energy fashion, with Mick Foley solemnly stepping out of character, visibly shattered by the loss of his friend, explaining how Owen Hart was Mick Foley's son's favourite wrestler, and how his son had been so proud to receive a haircut similar to that of his idol. Bradshaw spoke openly about the locker room's affection for their lost brother. Bradshaw mentioned how Owen Hart was one of the least flashy wrestlers outside of the ring, where Hart rarely afforded himself the luxuries that many others with similar bank accounts in wrestling would have, in order to save for his retirement and life with his wife and children. This one really hits home and humanises the incident further. It's so sad to think about what could have been for Owen and his family if things had played out in a less cruel manner. Many others paid tribute to the iconic figure on that show, including Val Venus, Test and The Rock. When Jeff Jarrett defeated Godfather for the Intercontinental title, the arena filled with claps and shouts of respect, with Jeff Jarrett screaming Owen Hart's name whilst holding aloft the title. Raw went off the air following a salute from then backstage leader Stone Cold Steve Austin, who smashed a few cans of beers for Owen and, in a cathartic moment for all involved, left one last beer in the ring. In the weeks that followed, online forums and newsrooms were alight with controversy over the manner in which the events had unfolded 
leading up to Owen Hart's death. The speculation revolved around WWF's use of a less safe version of the harness and cable which Hart was using at the time. This idea was taken to him and it was suggested that he came up, come out of the ceiling and I know there was a bit of a discomfort about, about the danger in it but somehow over the, the weekend he, he, he got sort of talked into doing it again. As part of Owen's Blue Blazer character, the performer wanted to move away from the ultra-serious, straight-faced Owen Hart and move towards the entertainment potential of a comedy-styled superhero. Prior to the event, Owen Hart had played with the formula of a wrestler being repelled towards the ring from the rafters when he would be a few feet from the ground, releasing his safety catch and purposely falling flat on his face, drawing laughs and applause from the crowd. WWF and Hart had tried and tested the stunt and it had proved effective at garnering their required response from the crowd at house shows. However, in order to facilitate the manoeuvre, a different, less safe latch had to be used for the quick release and without a secondary safety cable which was the standard at the time. For a month, the accusations flew at WWF and their backroom staff until the Hart family filed a formal lawsuit against the entertainment behemoth, as well as the manufacturer of the harness and cable equipment. Stating how dangerous and needless the stunt was, as well as arguing that the necessary safety checks and requirements were not in place, directly leading to Owen Hart's demise. On November the 2nd, 2000, after a year and a half in and out of courtrooms, WWF settled with the Hart family being paid $18 million, whilst also dropping the lawsuit against the equipment manufacturer. Owen was the youngest of 12 siblings and evidently left an enormous hole in the Hart family. His most famous sibling was Bret Hart, who on the DVD Bret Hitman Hart spoke about his regret in not being with Owen before he performed the stunt, stating that he would have tried his best to stop Owen from making this ill-fated decision. As is understandable with such a horrific event, the Hart family have held bitter feelings towards WWE since, disagreeing with the company's decision to continue the over-the-edge pay-per-view in wake of what had happened. Owen Hart's widow is also a target for controversy as she has made the decision as owner of the rights to Owen's career to sue WWE for its use of his televised performances. Something which Bret Hart staunchly disagrees with, siding with WWE in his ideas on how Owen's matches and screen time should be available for all to watch and relive their fond memories, not held in an archive as Martha Hart would seemingly like. In an interview with CBS Sports, Bret Hart explained, I think she's done more to erase my brother Owen's memory than she ever did to remember him. In reference to his brother's widow, it really bothers me, Bret remarked, that the fans that love Owen so much don't get a chance to remember him. Martha used a large chunk of the money received from the lawsuit settlement with WWE to found a charity in Owen Hart's name, which aims to help students from low-income families with tuition fees book purchases and other bills that are incurred. In the modern day, Owens' legacy lives on in numerous forms with WWF wrestler Kevin Owens not only styling his name as a homage to one of his idols but also naming his first son Owen as a reference. And, of course, the long-running and controversial debate of whether Owen Hart should be inducted into the prestigious WWE Hall of Fame with so many dark clouds hanging over the memory of Owen, you can perhaps understand to an extent why WWE would be hesitant to sift through those times again in such a public manner. Regardless of the way that he died or who is at fault, in my opinion, it is a disgrace to not have an icon such as Owen Hart, a man who literally spent his life entertaining and amazing as fans, feature in the WWE Hall of Fame. He deserves better. In researching for this video, I found it hard to dig up any dirt on Owen Hart. I couldn't find a story that besmirched his character or a video of him saying or doing anything regrettable. In the autobiography Heartbreak and Triumph, Shawn Michaels wrote, Owen is the only guy you could have a two hour show for and no one would say a bad word about him. At the time, Owen Hart's death led me to contemplate my own existence in a small way, which at that point I didn't begin to comprehend. It also led me on a path that I'm on today, so although for many a light was dimmed following the horrendous death of Owen Hart, 
it ignited in me a passion to learn about the history of pro wrestling and pay much deserved tributes to industry icons such as Owen Hart who have given their lives to perform and entertain us fans. been really bad out there you know we're going out there trying to do this and and we love this and we and and it's so rewarding for us too and uh and and we love doing it for all of you um but this this is what gonna happen some of us have spent the better part of the last 30 years together every day and uh when we have to um get the news that one of our brothers um passes away it's really hard silver wherever you are you know i loved you you're my friend and now you're known worldwide now you're a legend you worked so hard to become one now you are one so it can be gone in a wink of an eye in my opinion pro wrestling is an art form and the performers in the ring are artists in the same way that a master painter picks up a passion for laying out imagery on a canvas with a brush, pro wrestlers learn to master their chosen creative output whilst laying out matches on a canvas of their own. Some artists are born with a natural gift, a skill for expressing themselves through their chosen endeavour to bring joy and insight to the world around them through their work. Most artists, however, spend their lives learning the skills required to convey their artistic vision, and pro wrestlers are no different. To be a top performer in the squared circle, it takes passion, dedication and time. Often wrestlers will spend their entire working lives performing for the entertainment of us, the fans, in order to supply us with memorable moments which will go down in the history of the pro wrestling business. It's hard work. A cutthroat industry and, most times, extremely dangerous. In this video, I want to look at and honour the legacy of a man who has not only spent a chunk of his life on this earth attempting to entertain us, but who has given his life to the ring. I want to relive one of pro wrestling's darkest days through the harrowing story of a man who died. A sad topic, sure but one which I think is important to recognise. I want to see just how this horrific incident occurred and if it could have been prevented. And most importantly, pay respect to a man who made the ultimate sacrifice. I want to start by exploring my own memories, one of the worst days of my life. A dark cloud still fogs over me when I think back to that day when I witnessed the death of a beloved luchador a few years ago. It's still pretty hard and fresh to talk about and was the motivation for making this video. So, to begin on this troubled path, let's talk about Silver King. When Cesar Gonzalez Baron was born in 1968, he arrived in this world with pro wrestling in his blood. From a young age, growing up in Mexico, the man who would go on to spend most of his adult life performing inside of a wrestling ring was surrounded by luchadors. His father, Dr. Wagner, a trailblazing masked luchador who was one of the most famous and prestigious wrestlers in the Impresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre during the 60s, 70s and 80s. Silver King's brother Juan Manuel Gonzalez Baron wrestled under the name Dr. Wagner Jr and has himself gone on to have a stellar career between the ropes. Silver King's wife, So Chil Hamada, a legend of women's wrestling in Mexico, who herself came from a prestigious wrestling family, with her father being Gran Hamada. Silver King's nephew is El Hijo del Dr. Wagner Jr. Silver King was also the brother-in-law to Rossi Moreno, a fierce female wrestler who fought in Mexico and Japan. My point, Caesar Baron came from a family whose roots are so deeply entrenched in the history of Lucha Libre in Mexico 
the wrestling landscape may well look incredibly different without their involvement over the past 60 years. Although Caesar Baran is known widely for being the man under the Silver King mask, when he originally debuted in Universal Wrestling Association in November of 1985, his initial character, at least for his first year in the business, was the invader El Imbasor and wrestled without a mask. However, it wasn't long until he followed in his father's footsteps and donned a lucha mask, becoming a luchador and mascarada by the name of Silver King, a character which proved so popular that he continued with it throughout several parts of his life. Two years later, in November of 1987, Silver King fought in what is known as a bet match, where both contestants put their masks on the line. When Baron was defeated, as is tradition in Mexico, he was forced to remove his mask and reveal his true identity. For some wrestlers, this can be a major distraction from their career. Removing a mask to reveal your true self can oftentimes be a moment where a wrestler must either step away from the promotion and come back as a different character or begin to work maskless in future bouts. However, Passionate Lucha fans soon recognised Caesar Baron's family ties and realised his pedigree as part of such a formidable wrestling lineage. Without his mask, Silver King needed to redesign his wrestling persona. Thus, when he struck up a friendship with fellow unmasked Lucha El Texano, who was also looking for a new direction in his career, the pair seemed like a perfect fit. In 1990, the two men came together as Lost Cowboys and proved a force to be reckoned with. A year later, when the World Wrestling Association put together a tournament to crown their very first tag team champions, Lost Cowboys put on a spectacular display in order to be crowned the company's inaugural title holders. In January of 1992, Lost Cowboys had become a fan favourite duo, with both men finding their strides as a team. They became double champions when they defeated Gran Hamada and Kendo in Japan and brought the UWA World Tag Team Championships back to Mexico with them. Their time as tag champions in two promotions had brought the eyes of the world onto Los Cowboys as the pair were invited to travel to the United States to compete in a tournament for the prestigious National Wrestling Alliance Tag Team Belts. The competition was hosted by the WCW and gave both El Texano and Silver King connections within the company. At Clash of Champions 19, Lost Cowboys faced off against the fabulous Freebirds and lost. However, their performance in the match is said to have impressed decision makers within the company. In 1993, Silver King faced off against his partner El Texano in a singles match, one which was built on a friendly rivalry rather than any real animosity between the pair and when Silver King defeated his friend, he was awarded his first singles title of his career, the UWA World Light Heavyweight Championship. Despite the conflict during the match, the tag team partners proved that they were still as tight a unit as ever, as they made their way to their first major contract in Mexican promotion, CMLL. Upon arriving in the new promotion in 1994, Los Cowboys continued as a team while Silver King made his way up the singles ladder. He captured the CMLL World Heavyweight Championship in July from Black Magic, but Silver King's ambitions didn't stop there. By the end of 1994, Lost Cowboys were involved in a rivalry with the long-standing CMLL Tag Team Champions, El Kanek and Silver King's brother Dr. Wagner Jr. In December, Silver King and El Texano defeated the pair and won the CMLL tag titles, making Silver King the most important and well-decorated lucha in the company at that time. Not content to simply be the world and tag champions simultaneously while still holding the belts, 
Silver King formed a temporary alliance with another Lucha star with the Shocker, and the pair entered into and won the Torneo Gran Alternativa in 1995, a highly regarded exhibition featuring some of Mexico's top talents. Silver King and El Tuxano had seemingly conquered the entire Mexican wrestling scene and begun to look abroad for a wider calibre of competition. They travelled to Japan to compete for the International Wrestling Association of Japan's promotion and quickly became the IWA World Tag Team Champions. By 1997, Silver King had begun to visit America and heard of WCW wanting to sign luchadors in order to bring an exciting new spin to pro wrestling in the States. Leaping at the opportunity to make more money and reach a wider audience, relinquished his CMLL belt and made the move to Florida. If you are a fan of pro wrestling in WCW, then you will be familiar with Silver King. For me, this is where I first fell in love with the man in the black cowboy hat, although, unfortunately, he never managed to bring the prestige of his days in Mexico with him stateside. Primarily used in six-man tag matches alongside La Parker and Psychosis, Silver King never reached the heights which his time in the industry previously had suggested and remained low on the roster throughout his entire run with the company. Silver King appeared twice as part of the ludicrous three-ring, 60-man battle royal. His singles achievement for WCW was challenging for the Cruiserweight title at Full Brawl in 1998, but he was again unsuccessful. However, his opponent that night, Juventud Guerrera, would prove to be a significant one, and the pair would eventually meet almost two decades later in Silver King's last ever match. By the time WCW had collapsed and been bought out by rivals WWE, his lacklustre run with the company meant that his contract was never transferred during the takeover and Silver King returned to Mexico. It was at this time in 2000 that CMLL was partnered with New Japan Pro Wrestling and gave Silver King another chance to reinvigorate his character. He adopted the legendary Black Tiger character, one which was once used by Eddie Guerrero and had a brief stint in Japan, where he and his brother challenged for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Belts, but were unsuccessful. In 2003, as New Japan began to move away from the luchador performers and focus mainly on homegrown talent, Baron and his brother made their way once again back to Mexico. Baron was the first to regularly perform outside of Japan under the Black Tiger persona, using the character as a henchman of sorts for his brother, Dr. Wagner Jr. It's interesting, because at this time, fans were unaware that Baron was the man under the Black Tiger mask, and the company did not acknowledge the brothers' connection, as they worked as villains in the CMLL promotion. They teamed with Universo 2000, and the three men won the CMLL World Trios Championship, holding on to the titles for a year before being defeated. When, in 2004, their father, Dr. Wagner, died, the crowds came pouring out in support for Dr. Wagner Jr., who they recognised as a sympathetic son who had lost his beloved father. But as the fans did not recognise Silver King with his new Black Tiger persona, the company kept him as a rudo, the Mexican term for heel. This meant that without his brother, Black Tiger Mask was left directionless, a fact that was made all the more painful when New Japan named a new wrestler, Rocky Romero, as the legitimate Black Tiger Mask character, and Caesar Baron was forced once again to change his persona. Francis is the number one. His legs are number one. His eyes are number one. His muscles are number one. Baron's luck changed in 2005, however, when he was cast in one of my all-time favourite films. No one has bigger dreams 
than Nacho. When you are a man, sometimes you wear stretchy pants. It's for fun. Full of silly humour and in reaction, the story of Nacho Libre is one of heart, passion and helping those who need it the most. I loved the film when it came out and I recently re-watched it to better understand why I love a film that receives such a lacklustre and mixed reaction upon its release. Ignacio, played by Jack Black, is a downtrodden monk. The story takes place in a small village in Osaka, Mexico, a place where the best wrestlers are revered as idols and are offered a life of luxury and excess. Although Ignacio is a man of God and is forbidden from enjoying wrestling and praising in false idols, he is inspired when he witnesses the crowd gather to cheer and clap for their local hero. The villain of the film appears, the terrifying masked giant. As is tradition in Mexican Lucha Libre, we see several of the combatants, including Nacho himself, adorned in masks to protect their identity. This is as much a part of the fabric of the history of pro wrestling in Mexico as the luchadors themselves. As Ramirez steps into the scene, we see him adorned in a golden mask, a nod to another film based around the same story called La Hom o Mask Door from 1991 in which actor Victorio Gaetano wore a similar golden mask. The mask also clearly signifying this man's status as he pushes past countless adoring fans and into the arena. We find out that this sparkling man mountain is the most popular and powerful wrestler in the region at the time and arguably the best movie ever made about Lucha Libre. I watched it recently and even with 97% of its face covered, as soon as the character Ramses came on screen during the film, I knew that Silver King was the man under the mask. It immediately hit me with a sense of sadness on a personal level. It made me really remember just how much of an excellent wrestler he was and, and what an unbelievably iconic persona he had. The Ramses character is set up to be the final villain of the piece, but before we get there, he serves as the perfect opposition to Nacho. Starting out the film as someone who Jack Black's character wants to emulate in every way, it is made clear that Nacho is jealous of the money, fame, women and success of Ramses, and this sparks his interest in initially joining a lucha tournament at the Arena Oaxaca. Throughout the film, Caesar Baron shows off the years of experience he has working as a rudo between the ropes and out, a masterful display as we the audience are given every reason to hate this arrogant and powerful man. However, it's hard to truly find a place in my heart to hate on Ramses. Everything about him walks the line between charm and arrogance so well. Something about the twinkle in his eyes and the slightest hint of a grin means that even when Ramses is acting in a despicable manner, you still want to cheer him on for some reason. This also seems to be the case for the Lucha fans that we see during the matches in the film. Ramses is held aloft as the greatest luchador to ever live, and the crowds clamber to show their affection, cheering him on in large outpourings of love. When Nacho takes the children of his orphanage to meet Ramses, it is clear that even these youngsters who are forbidden from watching pro wrestling on television know all there is to know about this golden god of the squared circle. As children, they fail to see the negatives of their favourite performer, even when Ramses refuses to interact with them or give them a moment for an autograph. When Nacho and his tag team partner Escaletto attempt to gatecrash Ramses' party later in the film, we see that he is not only beloved by fans of Lucha Libre, but also by his peers. The birthday party thrown for Ramses is filled with masked wrestlers and powerful businessmen, all there to show their appreciation for a man who is at the top of his game. But the frivolities are not long lived, however. When Jack Black's character sneaks into the house as part of the musical entertainment, it doesn't take long for Ramses to realise and confront him. Everyone else seems to be having a great time, but we are reminded that Ramses does not dance at parties, throwing red wine all over Nacho's beautifully frilly blouse. We are given just enough time with Ramses's character before the big crescendo of the film. When Nacho makes his way through the wrestling tournament, he is afforded a chance to compete against the Golden Mask Lucha in the finals, a match to determine the true number one of this fictional wrestling world. 
I won't spoil the outcome for those of you who have yet to see this wonderful film, but what I will say, however, is that the final confrontation between our two main characters sees the character of Ramsay fall to the wayside as Silver King shines. Nacho Libre gives proper respect to several different aspects of Lucha Libre and Mexican culture in general, but in my opinion, the film's creators went the extra mile in order to pay homage to such an iconic figure and do so for Silver King in abundance. For a few moments we get to witness, in beautifully cinematic fashion, a brief and exaggerated display from a man who at this point had two decades of in-ring experience. Silver King's enormous and toned physique before the match really plays into him being the dominant villain whilst Nacho is the plucky underdog. He looks like a superstar as he walks to the ring amidst fire and celebration, serenaded by the beloved crowd. Throughout the contest we see Silver King's ability to control a match with his size and toughness, whilst also having the speed and agility to outmanoeuvre his opponent. Throughout the entire film, Ramses is created and delivered to us as the audience via scene after scene of subtle comedic timing and and a physical presence which dominates any frame which the cinematographer put him in. However, Nacho Libre released to a mixed reception and never reached the level of cultural icon that its predecessor Napoleon Dynamite managed. This means that although it still remains dear in many pro wrestling and movie fans' eyes, the film never reached a wide audience and Silver King's performance is perhaps not as appreciated as I feel it could be is a classic comedy starring Jack Black. Yeah, I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, and to be honest, in this film, Nacho Libre, he is at his most Jack Blackiness. But from the creators of Napoleon Dynamite, if you like the style and the feel of that film, then you're most likely, as a pro wrestling fan, particularly like the feel of Nacho Libre too. The jokes are a little bit silly, and part of it is pretty childish, but as an honest and seriously sincere letter of pure adoration and love for pro wrestling, you can see that the creators of the film really did put in extra effort to honour the thing that you know we all love. For me, it's always worth going back and watching it. If you haven't seen it, then I definitely suggest giving it a try. If you have already seen it, then this weekend, if you've got some time, stick it on again and get those warm, nostalgic feels from the early 2000s. What a great film. Ramses! How do you know him? He's the best. Silver King wrapped up filming and returned from being number one in Nacho Libre to having to find his footing on the pro wrestling ladder once again. Even with his newly found, if somewhat moderate, Hollywood fame, the continual change of characters for Baron struggled on. This time to the poorly received El Bronco meant that during this tumultuous period of his career, Baron was never able to regain the momentum he had found during his earlier years. He decided to return to what had made him a success in the first place and in 2007 once again donned the glittering mask to become what he was always destined to be, the Silver King. He returned to Japan this time with All Japan Pro Wrestling where within a year he had captured personal silverware. Silver King defeated Katsuchiko Nakajima and earned the World Junior Heavyweight Championship in March of 2008. The title reign would be shortly lived however and soon after dropping the belt not two months later, Silver King returned to Mexico. Over the next 10 years, Silver King reminded wrestling fans what he was truly capable of. Now a grizzled veteran of the ring, King's commanding presence in matches and his deep understanding of ring psychology saw him putting on some of the best fights of his career at this time. From run-ins with Vampiro, superb contests against the likes of Conan, X-Pac and Bobby Lashley, to countless tag partners as part of the long-standing Mexican tradition of trios matches, not to mention the fact that Silver King could rightly return to his place within the eyes of fans as a brother and a son, born in and bred for Lucha Libre. This decade saw countless matches between Silver King and his brother Dr. Wagner Jr. 
By 2014, the man knew his time as a performer was entering into its latter stages. He performed a few times in Japan and by 2019, his career was coming to its conclusion. He was about 51 by the time that I got to see him. And I want to share my own memories. For me, on a deeper level, the sadness comes from the fact that in 2019, I had convinced some friends who are not really wrestling fans at all to attend a lucha show with me in London. Ruben Cordero's Lucha Libre World, a show in collaboration with another wrestling company which had been interested in for a while, Lucha Britannia. I heard so much about a talented British wrestler, Cara Noir, and was intrigued to see his unique blend of mysticism, peacock feathers and excellent in-ring acumen. I have always wanted to see proper Lucha Libre performed live, and then I heard that Silver King would face off against Juventu Guerrero in the main event. My excitement for this unusual blend of pro wrestling magic had me buzzing. My friends, they were varying degrees of sceptical, but with the mariachi band ringing around the arena, some comedy matches to get the crowd on their feet, and a lot of margaritas in our bellies, we were all having such a great evening. Until... The match which I was most excited about took place. Two legends from my childhood, Juventu Guerrero vs Silver King. I'd been telling my friends about the two characters for days leading up to the event. When they made their way to the ring, I felt like a little kid again, and for me, that is a huge part of why I love pro wrestling. What happened next was horrendous. As the match got into its groove, after a fall to the mat, Silver King seemingly could not regain his feet. He was laid out, heavily panting on his back, not 10 metres away from us. Being the smart that I am, I grinned to myself as my friends turned to one another saying, Oh no, he's injured, I hope he's okay, and words to that effect. But I knew, all these years of watching wrestling, I knew that any minute now Silver King would pop back to his feet and regain his momentum, only to alight the crowd of his explosive power. I was waiting, longer and longer I waited. The referee was checking on Silver King and called Hooventude over to the pair. He then pinned Silver King and was declared the winner. This is when I began to suspect something had gone wrong. EMTs and trainers ran from the back and people started to try and resuscitate Silver King as the stewards in the arena hastily shepherded us out of the doors. It had taken them all so long to react. Surely this must have been part of the show. But no. It seemed to be part of the show at first, a member of the live audience shared with Camden News Journal. But then he didn't get up, and then the medical team was on the stage, everybody was cleared out, and lots of police and ambulances were there. I can still hear that moment in the arena to this day. The lively crowd had died right down, and it was eerily quiet whilst Hooventude and the referee attempted to pick up Silver King. It felt like an eternity as confusion spread around the seating area. As UV started to clap and tried to rally the crowd, it worked, but only for a moment or two, in a sea of almost silence. People around me started chanting, Silver, Silver, and a few others around the stand began to follow suit. But for some reason, in hindsight, it was so haunting, so uncomfortable, as those who were crying out began to subside with only a few small voices echoing out in the room. Then the most memorable part, seven of the longest minutes of my life occurred. As Silver King struggled to take his final breaths, suddenly everything became frantic. Those in the ring attempting to aid their fallen colleague seemed panicked and uncertain. Arena staff in bright yellow began ushering the fans out of their seats and we solemnly walked away from the ring and out into the street. Nobody around us knew what had happened, as hundreds of sad and concerned wrestling fans, many of whom were still wearing their decorative lucha masks, left the arena with questions and hypotheses. Some were still insisting it was part of the show, mere moments before the ambulance sirens rang out around the corner. Blinded by the neon lights, we made our way onto the train as those around us searched through the internet on their phones for an update. The coroner investigating the incident explained, In every way, there was a failure to properly plan to ensure that everybody knew what they were doing. 
that procedures were in place so that first and foremost a person who became unwell in the ring would be identified immediately. Immediate effective defibrillator assisted CPR would have given Mr Gonzalez a significant greater likelihood of survival. It seems Mexican wrestling does not have the same procedures in place as other sports such as regular wrestling or other martial arts. Hijo del Santo said, We never left him alone. The paramedics were there almost immediately. England is a first world country. The fans cooperated fully and left the venue without any protest. The promoter Ruben Cordero brought them best medics. Silver King's co-workers were with him the whole time. Not once did we leave him alone. My experience was a tremendous feeling of impotence I can't explain. The show was over so abruptly and we headed for the underground tube station. The sounds of ambulances and police sirens muffled the crowd's questions about what we'd all just witnessed. But it wasn't long before those dark questions had an even darker answer. The show was over so abruptly, and as we headed for the underground tube station, the sounds of ambulances and police sirens muffled the crowd's questions about what we had all just witnessed. However, this man's death has pushed the entire industry to be more aware of the signs of these injuries and changed the way in which wrestlers view early telltale signs of heart damage. Many still feel that at smaller wrestling shows a professional display of proper preparation at crucial moments is often lacking, with some accusing wrestling promoters and business owners of being unwilling to pay for the fees required to ensure these adequate safety measures are in place. Mascaro 2000 Jr. said, Please let's not be hypocrites with talks about athletic commissions and how now we're going to start demanding better working conditions for wrestlers. No, just stop to think. The only friend a wrestler has in the ring is himself, not promoters or these big wrestling companies. The only one left that is humane is the wrestler. That's the way it's always been. I don't want to try to hide the obvious. In Spanish the saying is, try and cover the sun with one finger. The same thing happened with El Ejo del Puero Aguero. 15 days, up to a month we saw ambulances at the venues, but no more. Now, I know that is miserable, but I wanted to highlight how Silver King died doing what he loved, entertaining the crowd and being the best showman he could. I mean no disrespect when I say this, but what a fucking hero. The man finished the match as he was dying, and that speaks to just how much Silver King loved pro wrestling. Silver King really are recognized for breaking through and and being the catalyst for you know a, a pop culture kind of phenomenon here in the United States that almost everybody is familiar with now. Silver King died doing what he loved. He was pushing his body further than most can imagine through brutal training regimes and hard stretches, traveling from show to show. He was entered into the AAA Hall of Fame in 2019, as I believe he has every right to be there. So, in my opinion, the very least we can do is remember the sacrifice which this man unmittingly made and hold up his legacy as we remember the name, Silver King. Okay. Right now, my number, Rams is the number one. You got it. You understand. Rams is the number one. Do you have a reason why these people would be dying under the age of 45? Why don't you ask yourself that question? I mean, why, why, why are you indicating that's my responsibility? These people are dead because... I'm asking you if it's in any way, shape, or form falls on your shoulders. I, I would accept no responsibility whatsoever for their untimely deaths. None whatsoever. As far as, and you've got that little look on your face like, yeah, I'm, geez, I'm, Vince, how none, can you possibly none, say that? Well, but none whatsoever. I mean, they wrestled mean, for you. They, they were part me, of they, your organization. They worked a couple of hundred nights a year for you. They oh live this oh, lifestyle. Oh, oh, oh my God, you can't, you can't believe. Oh, can you see that look? I mean, oh, how can you possibly say that, Vince? How can you look that way and you're giving me the old sympathetic No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly curious. Because I told you, these individuals worked for our organization at one time. They also worked for other organizations. 
I'm not responsible for the way the business was then. I wasn't responsible for the way the business, how they grow up in the, grew up in the business and whatever personal bad habits they developed. Why am I responsible for that? I gave them the opportunity. Well, you ran it. I, I, ran, one, I ran one organization. You controlled the biggest organization. I don't think we were the biggest at that time, quite frankly. Okay, we, we're the sole surviving organization now. But as far as looking back on all of this, these individuals developed a lot of bad habits. That's not, that's not my responsibility. Two years later in Japan, on March the 31st, 1999, an up-and-coming Japanese wrestling trainee, Amiko Kado, got the chance of a lifetime teaming up with Michiko Makai to face off against the pairing of Mariko Yoshida and Mikiho Futagami at the legendary wrestling venue Korakuen Hall in Tokyo, a feat which, considering she'd only had 14 matches in her short career, all of which saw her suffering defeat showed the potential which others must have seen in the young Amiko Kado. During the match, Kado was on the receiving end of a brutal headshot which saw her falling to the mat in clear distress. She was taken to hospital shortly after where the Japanese doctors did their best to save the 23-year-old's life. However, she had suffered an acute sprained membrane in her brain and died less than two weeks later due to a large amount of bleeding in her head. reputation is far and wide lethal Larry Cameron there he is making his way to the ring after making the transition from the Canadian Football League to pro wrestling in the late 80s and early 90s lethal Larry Cameron began to pick up speed as he earned notoriety as a supreme athlete inside of the ring both in North America and Europe Chris I work with lethal Larry Cameron on a tour of Australia about a year and a half ago, he's recognized as the world champion by the International Wrestling Association. He is one of the most awesome professional wrestlers in the world. By 1993, Larry had made several appearances with World Championship Wrestling before focusing his wrestling attention to Germany, where he had his most successful run. Problem woman, you want to get carried up also? During a match against Tony St. Clair in Bremen, Larry Cameron was struck with a large heart attack which killed him almost instantly. The referees and medical staff on call tried their best as they rushed to Larry's aid, but nothing could be done to save him from a fate seen far too often for wrestlers in the 90s. Larry Cameron was declared dead at the age of 41. Vince McMahon was the owner of the World Wrestling Federation, one of the biggest organizations back then. If you can't cut it, get out. What's wrong with that? No different than any other business, by the way. You know, if for some reason you have to rely on drugs, illegal drug usage, to make it, boy, you're going to self-destruct. Fifteen of the 60-plus wrestlers who have died worked at one time or another for McMahon's organization. On my left in the right corner, man who professes to be a man of mystery, at six foot seven, the mass emperor. A name which many American wrestling fans may not be familiar with, but those who enjoyed British wrestling in the 80s and early 90s will remember is the Black Baron. A hooded mask which concealed the identity of real life Kevin Corley, another sad name on our list. During a battle royal in London, the hooded wrestler slumped against the turnbuckle after suffering a lethal heart attack. The small crowd inside of the Lewisham Theatre had attended in hopes of seeing the roster of all-star wrestling put on an entertaining show but were left instead with the haunting vision of this dark and ominous character in a black hood with his life fading away from him in front of their eyes. 
The match continued on as the company attempted to distract the fans, but it was clear that the Black Baron was in serious trouble as he was helped to a backstage area where he died. He was only 46 years old at the time. Unlike the aforementioned performers, Eric Dennis was a Canadian wrestler who had plied his trade around the grappling world for more than two decades before his death. An in-ring veteran, the 40-year-old was a picture of fitness and health, using his great shape and conditioning to full effect in his matches. In October of 2017, however, during a charity event hosted by Insane Championship Wrestling, Dennis's heart gave out, leading him to suffer a fatal heart attack. As part of a 24-hour long tournament, part of the annual ICW Wrestling Charity event, Eric Dennis was facing off against Bulldozer when he went down. He had given up his free time to take part in an event which sought to raise money for those less fortunate than himself, and even though he showed no signs of health issues before the match, was struck suddenly and rushed to hospital, where he was pronounced dead, leaving behind a wife and six children, one of which, his eldest 14-year-old son, was present at the time of the horrific incident. Before our match, Eric told me he had a headache, pain everywhere, says Guy Garnier. I gave him two Tylenols. It was later found that he had told his wife before leaving that he was not doing very well. She had suggested that he stay at home. Despite everything, we had a super good match. When he covered me for the fall, he thanked me, a mark of respect that some have towards the person who puts them over. When he left, he had no pulse, confirms Ganya. I was angry because in my job, I have already revived strangers, and there I was, not able to save the life of a friend. We fought to resuscitate him, but as they say in my job, it's the guy at the top who decides. The wrestlers Real Sports contacted say both companies fostered an environment where bigger is better and anything goes. It was more of a Wild West show back in the 80s, no doubt about that. You know, and I think that you know, in terms of illegal drug usage, in terms of cocaine, there was quite a bit of that that, that, that went on. Um, again, I don't throw any stones. I was a part of that whole scene myself. In retrospect, how much do you attribute that lifestyle in the 80s to the deaths that we're seeing today and have seen since 97? Um, I think, I think that, um, that that lifestyle back in the 80s could partially be attributable to the way people uh, are acting uh, today. Again, most of us, the smart ones obviously grew up and grew out of those habits. But certainly in all the entertainment business, it was the Wild West. A lot of individuals, unfortunately, passed away as a result of that. In the Arena San Juan in Mexico City, tragedy struck in 2020 when the aerial prince or principero, a 26-year-old up-and-coming luchador, was overcome in the ring, when he suffered a ruptured middle cerebral artery, dropping him to the mat in front of the onlooking crowd. During a match against rival Red Mindo, Principero fell to the canvas after sustaining a number of hard chops across his torso. After the man under the mask, Luis Sangel Salazar, collapsed, his fellow wrestlers quickly realised the magnitude of the situation and frantically called for assistance from the medical team in the arena. Almost everyone present tried valiantly to give the aid to the fallen wrestler which was required, except for when a communication error occurred and another wrestler believed the stunt to be part of the show, continuing to attack the others before quickly realising the reality of what was unfolding before them. Ricardo Rodriguez, prominent Lucha Libre commentator, said of the incident, We always risk our lives when we get into the ring. We throw a coin into the air. Sadly, a young man has lost his life. I didn't know him personally, but I know he was very well thought of. Rest in peace, Prince Ibero. With Rey Mysterio also sending out his thoughts at the time, my sincere condolences to the family of Luis Angel Salazar. I ask God our Lord to give you the strength to heal this great loss and to have our brother Prince Ipero in his glory. 
What makes this tragedy even more sad is that Prince Ipero's mother and girlfriend were in the crowd that night to witness the whole ordeal, accompanying him to the medical facility across the road where he died from a brain aneurysm. The Savannah Tag Team Match featuring the Torres brothers, Alberto Torres and Raymond Torres. And his brother at 228 pounds, Alberto Torres. One part of the Torres brothers team, Alberto Torres was paired with Cowboy Bob Ellis and was facing off against Ox Baker and The Claw in June of 1971. In Omaha, Nebraska, after receiving a punch to the chest from Ox Baker, Torres screeched out in agony and slumped to the mat. His pancreas had ruptured and left him in need of immediate medical attention. Promoters in pro wrestling will oftentimes do anything to sell more tickets, and the promoter in charge of this match, Joe Dusek, was no different. So the story quickly became how Ox Baker's finishing move, the heart punch, had ended the career of Alberto Torres and that fans should pay to see who his next victim would be. However, this is before, only three days later, Torres' life would be ended prematurely due to the organ failure he suffered in the ring. Richard Delicious, whose real name is Wayne Van Dyke, died at the terribly young age of just 29 in a horrific manner. Whilst fighting on the Florida independent wrestling scene during a tag team bout, he began to complain to his tag mate that he was feeling rough and quickly tagged himself out of the match. Van Dyke felt pain in his chest and arm and collapsed to the ground. It was clear for all to see that he had suffered from a massive heart attack. The medical team and wrestlers surrounded the fallen Van Dyke, frantically delivering CPR in hopes of avoiding the worst. However, the CPR was delivered with such force that it broke Van Dyke's ribs and punctured his lung. Managers from the Ronin Pro Wrestling Company decided that the medical team and first aid crew wouldn't be enough to save Van Dyke, so transported him to a local hospital. Whilst in transit, however, he suffered a second, larger heart attack as everyone began to panic. By the time they arrived at the medical facility, Van Dyke was showing no signs of recovery and the doctors put him into a medically induced coma where he remained until his death shortly after. Brian Ong is a name which almost none of you would have heard of, the reason being that at the time of Ong's death, he was still only a wrestler in training, learning the ropes at the All Pro Wrestling Boot Camp in 2001. As is the case with many newcomers to the wrestling business, Brian Ong made an error in judgement while practising with several other trainees and suffered a concussion. Something which in hindsight should have been the point at which he went home rested and recuperated from what turned out to be a fatal head injury. Although, Ong was known by his friends and family for his determination and dedication to making his dreams of becoming a pro wrestler a reality, Ong was allowed to continue on with the training session and was said to be particularly excited to be given the opportunity to step between the ropes with some more experienced wrestlers who were working for the CZW promotion at the time. As the training session rolled on, Dalip Singh Rana, later known as the Great Carly in WWE, became Ong's training partner. The pair began to rehearse a simple flapjack move where Rana would lift Ong above his head and drop him face first towards the mat. Yeah, and I know I've even I talked to Kali about it, and you know he was he was sorry. It was it was it was just a very unfortunate accident. I heard it was a flapjack that Brian Ong took, and he kind of over rotated. You know, with, you know, Dali, uh, Dali being seven foot tall, you know, you know, he just kind of over rotated and landed yes. on his head. That's 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 the story I heard. However, due to his lack of experience and perhaps nerves of being held so high into the air, as Rana released him, Ong awkwardly clung onto Singh's clothing, causing him to land at a terrible angle, crashing down onto his neck and head something which the following legal case said was a decision made because of the concussion Ong had suffered previously that day. 
Ong's dramatic descent caused irreparable damage to his brain and spine, which doctors tried to treat at a local hospital to no avail, with Ong sadly passing away a few days later. You know, and then I had heard that there was an, there was an accident, you know, at the school. Um, I don't know much about it. Um, you know, apparently, I think the, the, the kid, I think, had some kind of like um, already pre-existing condition. But yeah, that was a that was a horrible scene. And it's, it's not anything that you, you, you ever think is going to happen in the wrestling business. We go in there night after night and we take chances. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, we could have our own health issues. We don't know what's going to happen when we hit that mat. The whole incident was unprofessional and could have easily been avoided if APW and the more experienced team training on had taken proper action when he received his concussion. The whole case was taken to court by Ong's family, who were awarded a $1.5 million settlement from All Pro Wrestling, who bore the entire blame for the accident. Fighting out of National Park, New Jersey, with an official weight of 208 pounds, representing that murder, death, kill gang worldwide representing for all his boys locked in the fucking cell Eastern Bloc representing the motherfucking hate club rest in peace Big Nate Hatred rest in peace his brother Justice Payne and you know what it is. It's MDK! All fucking day! It's MDK! All fucking day! It's MDK! All fucking day! The man! The king! The fucking god of this shit! Nick fucking Day! In recent times, you may have learned of Nick Gage's existence from his appearance on All Elite Wrestling's Dynamite show. Is he? Chris what Jericho, are you here? the pain maker. No. Delivered some right hands to the head of Nick Gage. Get out of there, Nick. Do you want your money or not? Get out of there. He's fighting. Ah! where he faced off against Chris Jericho in what is possibly the goriest and most hardcore match ever seen on live television, where the pair brought a taste of the ultraviolet to mainstream audiences through their use of exploding light tubes and a well-timed slice from a pizza cutter which, coincidentally, lined up with a picture-in-picture -picture advertisement for Domino's. The match was much applauded for its risk-taking and desire to push the boundaries of aggression within AEW, both men left battered, bruised, and soaked in blood. This is just simply barbaric. Oh my God, oh. Gage on the yacht, for God's sakes! There can be no intervention, there's no rules! Long-term fans of Gage wouldn't have been shocked, however, as the god of ultraviolence has been carving up his and his opponent's bodies in some of the most stomach-churning and exhilarating hardcore-style bouts in the history of wrestling for decades, on local indie shows and most notably in Combat Zone Wrestling. So what I do, I go out there and I kick the shit out of people and they realize why I'm the king of this company, okay? There's a difference what I do and then what they do on that TV stuff, okay? What I do is deathmatch wrestling and what that is is the best stuff going around and that stuff is real. Bar wire's real, glass is real. The moves the wrestlers do when they hit you with are way harder than they do on that TV. And excuse me if I like to use some weapons in my wrestling matches, some light tubes and glass and fire, okay? Murder, death, kill. Kill them all. And gratuitous violence. However, they are fans after all. And even with the tantalising title of Deathmatch, nobody in the crowd literally wants to see their beloved performers meet a grisly end. 
while still remaining adamant that he was well enough to continue in the match, he was not. An air ambulance doctors at the hospital, after being pronounced dead for around 8 minutes, in a big match. Call it reckless, call it toxic mass- Well, I'm known for, for the one where I got the cut under my armpit where I died, and, yeah. uh, you know? And uh, I wrestled seven days later, if no one knows that. That's insane, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I went to... Uh, you wanted to finish that match, which is crazy. Yeah, I did. I wanted to thank God. And she's an awesome lady. And I called her a bitch on tape, and I feel bad. I apologize to her. She was an awesome lady, man. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted them to tape it up. Thank God they didn't, man, because I'd be, you know, we wouldn't be having this interview right now. And, um, you know, I got flown in, and then um, I got released to the hospital on Tuesday... But they had that bag under your arm where it's draining the uh, blood and all that stuff. Oh my gosh, I got yeah. that taken out on Thursday with the 30 staples. And then I wrestled Saturday. <sighs> yeah, man. So it's just, you know, and you, you got to listen, man. You got to love this business. And if you don't love it, you're going to find out real quick. Wrestling, is, it has a tremendous entrance plan. You come in as, boy, here you are. You rock and roll and everything is wonderful. It's got no exit plan. And Rowdy Roddy Piper should know. A few months ago, he climbed back into the ring. What, what would you have me do at 49 when I, my pension plan I can't take out till I'm 65? I'm not going to make 65. It's just face facts, guys. There's no use in what-ifs when it comes to a subject as sensitive and deeply harrowing as the death of a professional wrestler, and nothing will change the amount of heartache and agony which the friends and loved ones of these athletes who have made the ultimate sacrifice must have gone through. However, their deaths have pushed the entire industry to be more aware of the signs of these injuries and change the way in which wrestlers view concussions and early telltale signs of heart damage. And one of the things is that they can check me after every match, but to make sure that I reach a baseline level of what my mental capacities are. And now they have a better understanding. So we have an impact test, which is what they have in a lot of sports, which is like, it's like a 15 minute test that measures your brain function, right? Well, now I have that test, which they can take right after a concussion, but now I have even more extensive tests. I did a two hour neuropsychological exam. So like now, for example, if they think that I have a concussion, they would have me first check with the doctor, then do the impact test, make sure that that's up to par with my previous impact test, then do another neuropsychological evaluation, which is like a two hour pencil and paper test. And so now they have all these ways to measure my brain function. The amount of heart attacks and brain injuries on this list is sad and staggering. A real concern to all athletes in the modern day, science and medicine has led us to a point where doctors are able to identify the early warning signs of these often fatal conditions and performers often have enough time to rectify the issue before the worst can occur. One day WWE has strict guidelines in place which sideline anyone who has suffered from even a minor concussion which in the long run means that less athletes will fall prey to these recurring nightmares. And as the current industry leader in regard to medical treatment and healthcare, I would hope that the wrestling business will never go back to a time where a wrestler is forced to perform injured, only to later go on to incur a much more serious fate. Every single wrestler on this list died doing what they love. They were pushing their bodies further than most can imagine, through brutal training regimes and hard stretches travelling from show to show. So... In my opinion, the very least we can do is remember the sacrifice which these men and women unwittingly made and hold up their legacy as we remember their names.